Tonight we honour Michael's memory with a lecture that will, I am sure, engage each and every one of us. I'm delighted to introduce the Honourable Michael Kirby, who will speak about the ACT marriage equality case in the High Court. He poses the question for us tonight, was the court's decision the final coup de grace to the originalist interpretation of the Australian Constitution? The Honourable Michael Kirby was Australia's longest serving judge when he retired from the High Court of Australia in 2009. Following his judicial retirement, he was elected President of the Institute of Arbitrators and Mediators Australia and served in that role from 2009 to 2010. In 2010, he was appointed to the Australian panel of the International Centre for Settlement, Settlement of Investment Disputes. He also serves as Editor-in-Chief of the Laws of Australia. In 2010, he was awarded the Gruber Justice Prize. He served from 2011 to 12 as a member of the Eminent Persons Group investigating the future of the Commonwealth of Nations. He was appointed as a commissioner of the UNDP Global Commission of HIV and the Law. In March 2011, he was appointed to the Advisory Council of Transparency International based in Berlin. In 2013, he was appointed chair of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights Violations in North Korea. He was also appointed as a commissioner of the UN AIDS Commission on Moving Aid from AIDS to the Right to Health and served in that role from 2013 to 2014. The order of proceedings will be that Mr Kirby will speak for around 45 minutes and he's kindly agreed to take questions for 15 minutes at the end of the lecture. We'll close at 7 p.m. sharp. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Michael Kirby, who will deliver tonight's Wincop lecture. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, thank you for having me. I pay my respects also to the indigenous people of our country who have suffered many injustices, which it is the obligation of all Australians to try to uh, correct and cure, and particularly if they are lawyers, because many of the injustices were inflicted as a result of views about the law. My respects uh, to Shelley Wincop, who is here tonight. In some ways, this will be a painful reminder uh, of the loss of her brother, but also uh, of her mother, most recently, Margaret. Uh, I was looking forward to meeting Margaret Wincop, uh, and um, she died in August. So, uh, unfortunately, I will not meet her tonight. But she is in my mind and that of others who knew Michael. I did meet and know Michael um, when he was a very young academic. And I think that was part of the problem. Michael was a person who succeeded mightily. And people who succeed mightily, naturally enough, uh, sometimes engender resentment, feelings of envy, uh, and... Um, that, I suspect, might have happened in Michael's case, though he never told me so. He was born in 1968. Now, 1968 is a long while ago. That is 47 years. I know that it's 47 years because I have been with my partner, Johan, since 1969. And therefore, uh, I know every one of those years uh, for me, they have been years of great happiness, ups and downs like those that happen in every relationship, but uh, overwhelmingly a great blessing in my life. You know, if you go to medical conferences, they always begin, before they put their interminable slides on the, uh, on the wall, <laughs> they always begin with um, acknowledgements of any conflict of interest or any... Uh, any activity or any money they've ever taken from anybody and so on. So I suppose I should really begin uh, my uh, talk to you tonight uh, 
with an acknowledgement that some might think I have a particular interest uh, in the issue of marriage equality, same-sex marriage. <clears throat> if you've been living with uh, a partner, the one partner, for 46 years, uh, then uh, obviously in recent years the thought, the possibility that quite contrary to our expectations back in 1969 when we met on the 11th of February, uh, marriage might become a possibility. And uh, therefore, uh, in that sense, I suppose, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is something that might eventually come to have an impact on my own life. And you have to take that into account in considering and weighing everything that I say about the matter to you, and you have to make your own judgments about uh, any opinions or assessments or conclusions that I reach. But I have to tell you that it's not at all certain we would get married. If you have been married to the one, well, or if you've been in a relationship with the one person for 46 years, it is getting a little late for the confetti. <laughs> Uh, and there's also this consideration that if you've got a wonderful relationship, would you want to change the integers? Would you want to bring some new dynamic into it uh, without there being a really good reason to do so? Uh, there's another consideration that if you have had a good relationship for such a long time, I mean, all those straight weddings we've gone to, <laughs> all of which, almost all of which have broken up, <laughs> and all those prezzies we gave out, <laughs> and never getting any presents at all ourselves. <laughs> if you've done that, there's just a little nagging thought in your back of your mind. If you got married, is that like acknowledging that everything to date has been something at a lesser standard of quality or a lesser standard of legitimacy so that you would feel the need to get something extra to make legitimate what in your own heart and in your inner soul, because relationships of that kind are very, very intimate to your soul, um, it, it, you don't want to do anything that reflects adversely on the relationship. And there's one other factor that I've got to tell you. My partner, Johan, Johan van Vloten, comes from the Netherlands. The people of the Netherlands are very difficult people. <laughs> they, they, they don't, how can I put this? They don't have the politeness of us Anglo-Saxons. I mean, they are extremely direct. They are very in your face. Everything has to be absolutely and totally honest. Sometimes I say to him, don't you think you could have come around that issue? Do you, do you think you had to be quite so direct? With, and he says, no, no, no. You Anglos, you're all very polite. <laughs> but then when they've gone, you put a knife in their back. <laughs> And so I've raised with him, I've said, Johan, would we, if it was possible, would we get married? And he says, too early to tell. <laughs> and therefore, um, I, I, I think though I reveal this, it's, I, I don't really feel it interferes in any way in my capacity to talk to you about the issue. And anyway, tonight, I'm not going to talk essentially about the merits or demerits. You can have your own, everyone can have their own opinion on that. Many people, most people have thought about it, have their own opinion. But <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk to you about essentially a technical thing because Michael Wincott was a very, very clever technical lawyer and he would be mad as hell if I came along here and just talked about... Uh, do you have it or don't you have it? He would say, that's not legal enough, not interesting enough to me. 
So I think if he were here, he would expect me to take a technical question. It's a technical question which I think everyone can understand. You don't have to be a professor of law to understand it, uh, but it relates to how we approach the interpretation of the Constitution. And what I'm going to do is really talk on three issues. The first issue is Michael Wincop. I can't stand lectures which are named for a person and then people turn up and they don't make any reference whatsoever to the person who is being memorialised. I went last night to a medical uh, conference in, in Sydney and the professor who was there was a brilliant man. He's a, one of the top researchers on HIV and AIDS. And the lecture, which is now in, I think, about its seventh year, is named for a, a, a young person whom I knew. I knew him well, uh, who was one of the early researchers on HIV in Australia who died of AIDS. Uh, and this... Uh, lecturer who came from the United States uh, didn't know this person and so it wasn't his fault but there was no opportunity for him or for somebody else to talk about the person whom we were remembering and to me who knew the person whom we were remembering I felt there was just something missing in, in the lecture and Therefore, I think when you have a memorial lecture, you should think just, just for a minute or so about the person who is being uh, honoured. And in the case of Michael Wincop, that's actually quite easy because he was a very brilliant man. He uh, went to the uh, University of Queensland and he got not one but two university medals, one in economics and one in law. Uh, and that's a remarkable achievement to be a double medalist. And then he came to Griffith University. Uh, he applied uh, to be a lecturer in law, which is the sort of lowest echelon. I suppose there's tutors underneath lecturers, but, <laughs> but you don't get too much lower than a lecturer. <laughs> and he got, he was immediately appointed and very quickly, within the space, the whole total space of his professional life was only 12 years from then, uh, he uh, went from lecturer to senior lecturer to associate professor to full professor in a very short time. Uh, he started with a, a master's degree in law, which nowadays wouldn't be enough to really get you into an academic life. You've got to have a doctorate but he got a doctorate by reason of his, um, his publications, and that was conferred on him by Griffith University. So everyone acknowledged he was brilliant, everyone acknowledged he was um, uh, extremely hardworking. Uh, he became the deputy to the head, <coughs> the head of the school, uh, Charles Samford, uh, and uh, his life ahead of him seemed to be promising an, an enormously important career. His particular area was uh, corporations and the theory of the company. Now, that's a very important subject for lawyers because actually the company is one of the very few legal inventions that is really brilliant and works. It, it's, it's an artificial construct that you separate the people who put the money into the company, the shareholders, and you, you then conceive of the thing, of the receptacle, as having a legal personality distinct from the people who invest the money. And it's because there's a limited liability on the people who invest the money that the corporation can take risks which those people worried about their money would probably not themselves take. And so the corporation is a brilliant invention. And the thing that intrigued and interested Michael Wincop in his legal writings and research was this dichotomy between the members of the company, the shareholders and the directors and officers and staff and so on, uh, and the company itself as a separate legal entity. 
And that became even more important in Australia after 2006, following Michael's death, because of the decision of the High Court of Australia uh, in the Work Choices case, which breathed tremendous life and power into the constitutional corporation under the constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia. So we were robbed and deprived of Michael Wincop's contribution to thinking through these issues of the corporation, uh, and that is a great tragedy, and that is our loss. Uh, and on this evening, uh, this beautiful night here in Brisbane, uh, we think of a very distinguished scholar uh, and a great teacher, a person who, by all accounts of his colleagues, despite his brilliance, was very kind and nice to other people. That doesn't always happen, I can tell you. People who are brilliant are sometimes not quite so nice. Some of us are very nice. <laughs> But there are other people <coughs> who, are, who are less nice, but Michael Wincop was a very decent, kind person. He was the sort of person you could approach and would talk uh, with you about uh, your problems, and uh, he had problems of his own, uh, but um, we have honoured him by having this lecture. And so we reflect on him and on the loss of his life, on his family, on his late mother and father, and uh, we're very glad that Shelley's here tonight with us. So that's the first part of my talk. <clears throat> the second part is to remind you of how we got to this point of marriage between people of the same sex. Um, certainly, uh, back in 1900, when the Australian Constitution was written, if you'd asked the uh, old gentlemen who gathered in Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney, uh, uh, when they put into section, section 51, uh, paragraph 11, the power for the federal parliament to make laws with respect to marriage and divorce, what does marriage mean? If you'd said, what does marriage mean? Well, overwhelmingly, I would suggest, I would think, uh, probably 95% of them would have said, oh, well, that's when a man and a woman get married, they, they form a, a union and uh, they probably go on to have children. And uh, that was what the common law had said marriage meant in a, a, an important case called Hyde against Hyde which was a case in England challenging a Mormon marriage. You know the Mormons have or had under their particular religious text a belief that you could have multiple uh, sexual partners to a marriage and um, the question was, was, was that a valid marriage for the law of England? And the court in England, uh, I think it was in 1866, said marriage means the uh, union uh, for life to the exclusion of all others between a man and a woman, one man and a woman, one woman. And that was the common law definition of marriage against the background of which the constitution of the Commonwealth was written when it put in the, Commonwealth, the parliament of the Commonwealth shall have powers uh, subject to this constitution to make laws uh, for the peace, uh, order and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to, down to paragraph, paragraph 11, marriage and divorce and in relation thereto to the uh, guardianship and welfare of children. So marriage was in there and the question was, what does it mean? Um, that question lay dormant for a very long time in the Commonwealth, for the first 60 years of the Commonwealth, uh, there was no federal law on marriage. That was curious, because one of the reasons why the founders of the Commonwealth put 11 in was because they'd been over to the United States where marriage was not included in the powers of the Congress, and therefore where marriage was left 
to the legislatures of the states of the United States. And they'd seen the situation in the United States where you had uh, the um, marriage laws quite uh, significantly different from one state to another. Uh, and there was the Reno marriage. You remember the Reno? You could go to Reno and get married and divorced in an afternoon. Uh, though why you would bother to do that just for one afternoon, I don't know, but, but, but people did it. And uh, the, the Australian old gentlemen, and they were all gentlemen who drafted our constitution, didn't like the idea of that. And so they said, well, we're going to make this a federal power. And they put it in the federal constitution as paragraph 11, but nothing was done about it. It wasn't the subject of an act to give effect to that power. Uh, and uh, the law differed from one state of Australia to another up till 1961. Um, some states simply relied on the common law and on hide against hide, that case I told you about the Mormon marriage. Uh, they had the common law marriage made by the uh, definition by the judges and they accepted that. And some states had their own marriage act. But eventually, um, the federal parliament enacted a new law for uh, divorce, uh, and uh, that was quickly followed by a new federal law for marriage in 1961. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the definition of marriage was left opaque. It, it wasn't uh, defined in terms in the hide against hide language. It was simply left marriage, and people generally assumed it just meant what the judges had said in Hyde against Hyde. Uh, but then in 1961, the law uh, was enacted and uh, that continues to operate to this day. Uh, round about 1974, as a result of um, initiatives that were taken in, uh, first of all, South Australia, the criminal laws that had existed from the beginning of British settlement in Australia against gay men, there were never laws against gay women, but there were laws against gay men which said that if they ever had any sexual activity, um, even though it was in private, even though they were adults, and even though they fully consented, that was criminal. And uh, the pun punishment was very severe. And of course, that law had a number of consequences. Uh, on the, in the afternoon newspapers, as I was growing up, you'd see one more scandal of somebody who had been caught by agent provocateur police entrapping young, young policemen, entrapping middle-aged gents uh, and um, as well as that, it, it uh, put into the mind of a gay person growing up that they were somehow dirty and really horrible and subject to these criminal laws which they must really try to avoid because it would be so shameful to them and to their families and therefore many of them... Uh, led lives of great loneliness. In my own case, my solution was very simple. I became the king of the university committees. I became a student politician extraordinaire. I went from one conference of university students to another. I had one committee after another. I was brilliant and it was very useful to me later because it taught me the skills of running meetings and then running courts. So it had a, a tiny little silver lining to it, but it meant that people looked down on themselves and it meant that they couldn't tell the people who were most important in their lives, their parents, their siblings, their grandmother, uh, and it wasn't a nice scene. But it started to change in 1974. And by 1984, in most of the states of Australia, it changed. It took a long time in Queensland. It was the Goss government that came in that changed it in Queensland. And even then, they and Western Australia started it with a... The amending act had a preamble that said, 
the Queensland Parliament does not really approve of homosexuals and the Queensland Parliament is reluctantly doing this uh, and it does not wish by doing this to give any credence or respectability to that lifestyle. Boy, I hate that word lifestyle. As though your sexual orientation and your feelings of love uh, for another human being is a lifestyle, like collecting uh, butterflies from South America or, or being passionate about uh, motor cars. I mean, it's not a lifestyle choice. It's just part of your, your being, as is uh, heterosexual orientation. Anyway, eventually all of the states, even Tasmania, the last state to change, changed the law uh, that got rid of the criminal law. You couldn't even begin to think about same-sex relationship recognition if you had criminal laws against gays because the whole point of the criminal law was lock them up and throw away the key. It wasn't to recognise the legitimacy of their relationships. Uh, and then another thing happened in Australia. In 1984, uh, laws started to get enacted for de facto relationships. Some uh, uh, straight people were forming relationships and not getting married. And that was a scandal for those of a generation before living in sin. Uh, but some people were quite happy living in sin and they just didn't bother to get married and, and the law started to make provision to deal with the dependency questions. If they fell out, uh, was the person, usually a woman, uh, to be left completely unprotected by the law and so de facto relationships laws began to be enacted. In New South Wales in 1984, in Queensland, it wasn't until I think about 2003 or thereabouts. It took a long, long while to come about here. This is such a proper state that I'm in the middle of here. <laughs> uh, but uh, eventually these laws were being enacted to protect uh, straight couples, heterosexual couples, uh, who were not married but had dependency relationships and property entitlements and interests, and then those laws began to be invoked by gay couples when they split up. And so that began to push the envelope just a little bit further. And uh, at this stage, in the year 2000, a very unusual thing happened. And where did it happen? Well, where else except the Netherlands? In the Netherlands, a law was passed by the Netherlands Parliament and it was called On the Opening Up of Marriage. That's how the... I, I think it's oplading or some word like that. To open up marriage. And it provided for the first time in the whole world for uh, a legislation to extend marriage to same-sex couples. Uh, now, just stop and think there. 2000... Since 2000, um, the opening up of marriage has been accepted now by about 25 countries around the world. Most of them are in Europe and in North America and in New Zealand and there's Argentina, uh, Uruguay and some parts of Mexico in Latin America. Uh, there, there's only South Africa in the African continent, nothing in the Caribbean, and nothing in Asia. Uh, but in Europe, most of Europe now has either civil partnership, civil union, or uh, same-sex marriage. And it's amazing. This is truly, in legal terms, a revolution that within such a short space, 15 years, it's amazing, isn't it, if you stop and think of it, you know, within 15 years, what was unthinkable and impossible has become normal in Western-type democracies. And it doesn't seem to matter whether they are Protestant countries from the north of Europe or Catholic countries from the south. Uh, Spain and Portugal have adopted uh, marriage equality, Argentina, 
uh, and Uruguay, strong Catholic countries have adopted it. So it just seems to be connected with the state of development of the country um, and uh, with civil society groups that get their act together and try to press for such laws. And in Australia, um, the ACT, that small territory, uh, became very stroppy. And they were the first jurisdiction to adopt a law for civil union. This was in 2004. And that was really pushing the envelope. It was passed in the ACT by an almost unanimous uh, vote in the Legislative Assembly of the ACT, and it was sent up uh, to, the, uh, to be laid on the table, as all the laws passed in the ACT are, of the Federal Parliament, because under the Constitution it's a federal territory, and the Federal Parliament had never once... Um, set aside a law of the ACT since self-government in 1988. Uh, but um, the government, uh, led by Mr John Howard, decided this was a bridge too far and they advised, uh, they got the parliament to uh, adopt a resolution disallowing the law. Um, the only other time that that has ever been done was in respect of the Northern Territory of Australia, which is in the same constitutional relationship, uh, and it passed a law, you may remember, on euthanasia, and that was disallowed. Generally, the Federal Parliament doesn't interfere. Having given self-government, they say, well, you're on your own now, boys and girls, you can do what you want. But on this case, the law was disallowed by the Howard government and by Parliament, and uh, as well as that, alerted to this step in the ACT, Mr Howard and his government took a step modelled on steps that were occurring at exactly the same time in the United States with the so-called DOMA law, Defence of Marriage Act, DOMA. And uh, that law was extremely important in the re-election of Mr George W Bush to the office of president because that was a really hot issue in his re-election campaign uh, against John Kerry and it made the difference so it was said in Iowa when it was almost line ball and Mr George W Bush got back in a fight over uh, <coughs> the, the pressure for marriage equality. So it was a very hot topic. The Federal Congress and lots of the states in the United States passed the DOMA law. Uh, and at this time, uh, in Australia, the ACT Parliament said, OK, we'll put our thinking caps on. They don't like the fact, so Mr Howard says, that this is uh, mimicking marriage. And maybe we've used the wrong word, uh, union. Therefore, we'll take union out and we'll call it a partnership. And so the ACT legislature passed a Civil Partnership Act. They then sent that up to the federal parliament and by this stage, um, th that famous Queenslander, Kevin Rudd, had become the Prime Minister, Kevin 07. And uh, the matter came to the federal parliament but in the course of the election campaign in which he'd been elected to office and his government, uh, Mr Rudd had given an undertaking that in the first term of government the Labor Party would not proceed with uh, as, uh, any form that mimicked marriage. And so when the second bill came from the ACT, that was also disallowed by the Labor government. So the coalition had done the first disallowance, the Labor government did the second disallowance. Now, you've got to admit the ACT people are very pesky people. There must be a lot of Dutch people down there. <laughs> and they brought up a third bill. Uh, and this was a bill uh, which was called uh, the Marriage Equality Same-Sex Bill 
uh, Act, and it was adopted by a very strong vote in the Legislative Assembly, the ACT, and they said, we are uh, not challenging the federal law, we are enacting an ACT law on this subject. Mr Howard, going back a step, had taken s steps uh, in 2004 to amend the 1961 Marriage Act to include a number of provisions in it, no recognition of foreign same-sex marriages, and uh, in respect of same-sex marriages, no same-sex marriages to be solemnised, to be conducted, uh, or to be recognised in Australia. So they were put into the Marriage Act, and then there was a third provision, which if you've been to any marriages recently, you will know uh, the requirement on whoever conducts the marriage, whether it's a, a priest, a minister of religion, or a civil celebrant, to read out a little passage, marriage under the law of Australia means a marriage between one man and one woman to the exclusion all of all others for life. That's read out uh, in any marriage ceremony in Australia. And that reminds you that uh, as for these pesky gays who are claiming to have the same entitlement, well, they can't have it and it's against the law in Australia. But the ACT pressed on and they enacted their law. They tried to get around the f provision by saying, what we are doing is not a marriage. No, 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 not a marriage of the kind that the federal parliament has provided for. This is an ACT marriage and it's not uh, a marriage of a federal kind. It's just a little territory marriage. <laughs> and uh, therefore, uh, it can live with the law that is enacted by the uh, federal parliament. Uh, and that was the question that was challenged one month after it was elected by the Abbott government. The Abbott government came into power in, I think, September, August, September 2013. In October, they issued a writ in the High Court of Australia, challenged the ACT's third piece of legislation, and that challenge came before the High Court in December 2013, and it was all decided in a space of nine days. Very, very quick. It, the court brought it on quickly because people were getting married in the ACT. And uh, this was being challenged by the federal government and the High Court felt it had to make the decision quickly and it did. Within nine days, it had handed down its decision, which was unanimous, and the decision said... Um, you cannot have an ACT law. Whatever you say is the difference. It is uh, essentially the game is given away by the fact that you call it the Marriage Equality Act. And if it's the Marriage Equality Act, then this is a marriage. And the federal law, with which you cannot be inconsistent, has said that you cannot have uh, in Australia the celebration or the recognition of a same-sex marriage. And therefore, the High Court of Australia immediately decided that uh, it had to strike down this third attempt. So the first two attempts, the first attempt struck down by the Howard government, the second attempt struck down by the Rudd government, the third attempt struck down by the mightiest striker down of all, the High Court of Australia. I wasn't on the High Court of Australia at that time. Uh, and it was unanimous, and in my opinion, it was the correct legal decision because it, the, the ACT Act was inconsistent with the scheme and provisions of the Federal Act. Now I come to the important point that I wanted to mention in this lecture, and the important point relates to the reasoning that the High Court took on the matter, and the reasoning related to... Um, the question of the interpretation of marriage in section 5111 of the Australian Constitution. Before any of this happened, 
some scholars, often from a religious background, and lawyers from a religious background, wrote articles saying there's no way that the federal parliament can ever enact a law for same-sex marriage. And this is because the constitution of Australia has to be interpreted by what marriage in paragraph 11 meant at the time the constitution was adopted and brought into force in 1901. And at that time, marriage meant marriage between a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others for life. And therefore, that is what the constitutional term meant. And therefore, the federal parliament will never have the power, so some opponents of same-sex marriage said, it'll never have the power to enact a law on same-sex marriage uh, uh, because that was not what is meant by marriage in the power that was given to the federal parliament under paragraph 11 of section 51 of the Constitution. Uh, now, some people have criticised the High Court for proceeding to say that the um, meaning of marriage in uh, the Constitution is wide enough to include the power of the federal parliament to make a law for same-sex marriage. They had to say that in order to um, indicate that this was a federal power, a power which the federal parliament could use and only the federal parliament could use. So that the criticism of the court saying you've gone into this matter which is not in dispute between the parties, there is not a contradictor who is arguing that you are wrong and you have decided the issue which was unnecessary to the case. But I think in fairness to the court, because this idea had been put around that the federal parliament would never have the power to enact same-sex marriage, if that were the case, then the argument of the ACT would have been stronger. They would have then been able to say, the federal parliament can't enact the law, then surely the ACT could enact the law uh, for the people of the ACT. If the feds can't do it, then the ACT can do it because it still has the residue of the power of the people to make laws. And so uh, that uh, step was taken. The High Court said the federal parliament has the power, only the federal parliament uh, can exercise the power and an ACT law that is contrary to the present Marriage Act is not valid under the Constitution and under the self-government law of the ACT. And the interesting question from a technical point of view, Michael Wincott would be most fascinated with this subject, the interesting question is um, what is the, uh, the reason for the High Court proceeding into this question and was it essential for it to do so and does it indicate that the High Court has rejected the original intent view of the interpretation of the Australian Constitution? There are judges in the United States particularly, Justice Scalia is the strongest proponent who says, uh, unless you stick to the meaning of the original intent, unless you stick to the meaning of those who framed the Constitution, in the case of the United States, in 1791. Unless you stick with that, then you are all at sea and judges can make up what they think the constitutional words mean. The value of sticking to original intent, they say, is you then have an anchor for the meaning, which is an objective search, and that is fixed in time and it is objective, and it's not just left to the judges. The judges are doing judge-like activity of finding what marriage meant in 1900, and, or in the United States, finding what due process meant in 1791. Uh, and there's an argument in favour of that point of view. It, 
the argument is essentially it gives an objectivity to the process of the meaning of the Constitution. The fundamental problem with the argument, as it's always seemed to me, is that, um, unfortunately, uh, there's always going to be argument about the meaning of a constitution, and the whole point about a constitution is to have a basic law that will operate in society over the, de uh, over the decades, uh, over the centuries, uh, in utterly different circumstances. And that's what a constitution is for. And therefore, to lock them back so that they're always reaching behind them for a 1791 dictionary or for a 1900 dictionary is to impose a very artificial process of giving meaning to the constitution, which is supposed to be for the good government of the people from decade to decade and year to year and century to century. And so, insofar as the High Court has uh, said that you don't impose on the Constitution the hide and hide meaning that the word, even though a legal word, had in 1900, the High Court has indicated, without necessarily affirming that it was doing it for this purpose, that it is not being stuck with what Justice Scalia would say was essential the meaning at the time the Constitution was written. And that's a technical question, but it's very important for the working of the Australian Constitution. And it's important for the working because we know it's very difficult to amend the Australian Constitution. We've had, I think, 44 efforts to amend our Constitution, and uh, I think the number is eight have succeeded. Very hard to change the Constitution. And that's why having a constitution which is fixed like stone is going to be very bad for the governance of Australia. Having a constitution which adapts and changes its meaning and the judges have to give reasons and explanations for why they think it has a new and larger meaning uh, is a, a much better way to govern a country and it is in fact what the High Court of Australia has done. So. I've honoured Michael Wincott. Uh, I've told you something about the history of how what was unthinkable has suddenly become this enormous revolution which is happening right around the world. Not happening quite so fast in Australia, but it's uh, in the federal parliament and there are bills and there's talk about a plebiscite and even of a referendum, though I don't think you need a referendum in the light of what the High Court has held is the power of the federal parliament. There's no need to get more power to the federal parliament. They've got the power. It's a question of whether they want to use it. And finally, I've raised the tricky, interesting constitutional question of how the judges go about giving meaning to that word. There it is. It's just a little word, marriage. What does it mean? Does it, does it mean what it meant in 1900? If it does, man and wife to the exclusion of all others. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it can adapt to changing social mores and attitudes. And if so, it's available to be used if the federal parliament chooses for same-sex marriage. And uh, the High Court took the latter view. And that is not only important for the case of marriage, but it's very important for the way the court goes about interpreting all the other words in the Constitution in the light of the meaning of those words, uh, not in the year 1900, but relevantly in the year 2013, or 2015 for a case that comes before the court today. So that's my lecture to honour Michael Wincop. I think I haven't read you a text. I find that very boring. I mean, you might think that an oral address was also rather boring, <laughs> but uh, to lawyers, it's fascinating, endlessly fascinating. And I think I should get a very big round of applause. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Now, we're going to have...
about uh, 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour of questions and let the lights be turned on so that we can see each other and we will uh, have uh, questions and answers. A shorter word than marriage is the word jury. And the High Court determined what jury meant using a process, the opposite of the process of determining marriage. Do you have any view about the difference? No. Well, in fact, I think that's a very good question. In Section 80 of the Constitution, there is one of those rare provisions, which you could call a human rights provision, which says that where there is an indictable federal offence, the matter will be tried by jury. And the High Court had to decide what jury meant. Now, in 1900, what did a jury mean? It meant 12 men, only men, trying a case uh, in circumstances where they're locked up every night, because the cases were usually over in one or two days, uh, and uh, they can't be replaced. You can't have jurors in waiting in case the trial goes on for months and you've got to, somebody dies or goes mad listening to the evidence. Um, and so I, I don't think it's different. I think it's exactly the same thing. And in fact, the fact that in the case of the meaning of the word jury, the High Court says, well, OK, back in 1900 it meant 12 men, but it doesn't mean 12 men now. It means 12 men and women. It doesn't mean, as it did in 1900, only men of property. It now means citizens. Uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that you can't um, you let the jury separate. You, you, you don't have to lock the juries up because now we have trials that go on for months. And therefore, if you locked them up, you'd never get anybody to serve on the juries. They'd all have all sorts of excuses with their families and their jobs. And therefore, um, you have to adapt the word. And so uh, your illustration's a very good illustration, but it's an illustration which proves again that the High Court in those cases has not adapted, adopted a 1900 approach. It's adopted an approach of the time when it is deciding the case. And that, I think, is what's necessary. And why is it necessary? Because a constitution is not a dog and goat act. A constitution is a, is a law under which other laws are made, and it therefore has to be an umbrella law which is broad enough and interpreted broadly enough to adapt to the very different circumstances. Just look at our country today in comparison to our country in 1900. I mean, it's such an utterly different country. The technology is so utterly different. The social values are utterly different. The racial composition of the, of the population is utterly different. The, the industry and economics is utterly different. And if you just rigidly and frigidly stuck to what words meant, whether it's jury or marriage back in 1900, you'd have a very inflexible constitution. Given that a lot of the laws that we have now recognise de facto relationships, and including same-sex marriage, well, same-sex relationships, sorry, like superannuation, for instance. What would be the point? Why, why would, should we then why? change? Yeah, why should we change the marriage acts, given that they have as many rights now as married people? Well, it's true that the de facto relationships act uh, does give uh, a high measure of protection to people uh, in the event that their relationship breaks down and that doesn't leave people, generally women, on uh, the shelf without the due protection, for example, the ownership of the home and things like that. Uh, so it's true that uh, to that extent the law has stepped up to dealing with the social arrangements of our time. But uh, I think that the people, mostly young people, who want um, marriage recognition um, as Justice Kennedy in the US Supreme Court said, they don't want it to damage marriage. They want it because they honour marriage. They want, it, they want to have that relationship for themselves uh, as an affirmation of their love uh, and of their fidelity and of the fact that they are citizens. And they ask the question, ask not why it should be provided, 
but ask why it should not be provided in a secular country with a secular constitution. Why should the fact that some people are um, opposed to it, usually for religious grounds, intrude into the right of other citizens to have it if that's what they want? Um, there are, of course, some gay people and there are a lot of straight people heterosexual people who don't want marriage. Well, nobody's saying it's, it's got to be compulsory. Nobody's saying you've got to get married. The question is, should it be available to people if they feel a need for it? Now, my best way of explaining the answer that I think should be given to your question is, a lot of young people finding that they are of minority sexual orientation they have a very hard journey, I can tell you, because I went that journey myself. They find it difficult to be honest to the people who, with whom honesty is the most important thing in their lives. Their parents, their siblings, maybe their grandmother, or other close people. And they also can't have the sort of rites of passage that other citizens have, which includes often a marriage arrangement. They can't have their family and their friends to affirm the love that they feel for another human being. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you're lucky enough to have a partnership, a relationship, a loving one, uh, it's very good for your health, very good for your mental health, very good for your physical health. It's good for the citizens because you become, in a way, a more reliable type of citizen. You build a household, you have, uh, in some cases, family, you have um, a, a serious business of keeping your job and making enough money to make sure that you're not going to let anybody down and so on. And you get the presents. And, <laughs> and, you, and, uh, and I think... Um, that is something that doesn't matter very much to an old fogey like me. But to young people, I, I speak to young people in this area, both heterosexual and uh, sexual minorities, and they do feel a big need to have something which says, this is okay, get off my back, this is okay, this is me, I'm not going to change, I didn't choose it, it's just me, and uh, get over it. Have, a, have an aspro, have a lie down, <laughs> and it's, it's going to be better tomorrow. <laughs> One more last question. One <laughs> yes. Yes. The uh, question of originality, um, present company accepted, doesn't that uh, uh, open the court up to a lot of partisan politics as compared to, you know, uh, what other constitutional interpretation goes on? Well, that's just a Scalia's argument. He says if you don't have an anchor, then you're all at sea and you can... Uh, it's all going back to... Uh, what the judge himself or herself means. My own answer to that is, unfortunately, in human justice, you can't get away from that because the judge has... You've got to trust somebody to draw the line and in our system, uh, that is the judges. And if we look at our country, I think one of the best things about our country uh, is that uh, the judges are not corrupted you may disagree with their decisions. They've got to write it out, they've got to explain it, and you can criticise it. I mean, no judge is beyond criticism. Uh, and we do criticise our judges for, the, for their decisions. But that's a limitation on, on going too far. Um, but to explain that a jury today is not just 12 men of property. I mean, who would say it should be 12 men? That's a very artificial thing. And to say that marriage, likewise, is not just confined in a world which since the year 2000 has changed so radically in so many countries, if it can be done in Argentina, why can't it be done in Australia? 
it's not compulsory and the world isn't going to absolutely collapse. It hasn't anywhere else. Having it elsewhere hasn't led to a huge outbreak of polygamy. <laughs> uh, it's just saying the people who are in a long-term relationship, most of whom, by the way, now get married in the local park. I think it's something like 75% of Australians don't get married in a church. They get married in a park with the willows and the wine and everything. Uh, and if that is so, then those people who, for their own religious reasons, don't like this, um, should be told very politely but quite firmly, well, you are entitled to respect for your views. Uh, nobody's saying that your churches or should be forced to have these marriages, but if they want to join their mates uh, at a marriage in the park, that they are citizens and they are entitled to equality of treatment and our constitution permits it, our constitution reserves it to our federal parliament and our federal parliament will ultimately make the decision. And I think if you look at the flow of history on this matter, it's no more likely that we will go back to 12 men of property than it is that we will stick to denying to some citizens who want it the benefit of a marriage which is good for society, good for the people involved. That's it.